everybody. Welcome. I'd like you to invite you to take your seats, please. Good morning. We're going to bring the conference to order. Just give a sec for people to find your seats. Thank you very much. Wow. That was fast. Thank you very much. We have over 460 people registered with walk-ins. We may approach 500 here today at the 15th Ounce of Prevention Conference. Thank you very much for coming. We have a surprise in the program. I'm Jeff Wilkinson, Senior Policy Advisor to the Commissioner and a proud MC for you today. Uh, we're going to dispense with the program as it's printed in your agenda for the very early part uh, because we have a very special guest with us this morning to help us open the conference. And um, Secretary of the Executive Office of Health and Human Services, Dr. Judy Ann Bigby, is with us. She has an event with the governor later this morning. So she has limited time with us, but uh, it's, a, it's a measure of her respect for Commissioner Auerbach and the Department and Public Health. And she has been a true champion of public health through her tenure as one of the longest serving secretaries of health and human services in the Commonwealth, uh, a, a, an incredible friend and true champion and leader, Dr. Judy Ann Bigby. <laughs> people to be here to do an ounce of prevention. That makes 500 ounces, right? <laughs> That's wonderful. Um, I am a big supporter of public health, and I know that all of you here are also big champions of public health. And I want to thank you for the work that you do every day. Um, it's not often that we get to celebrate the work of public health because in many ways it's invisible or if it's not that fancy new thing, uh, we often forget that it takes doggedness, a commitment every single day to pay attention to the public's health. And that's why I'm here this morning. As you all know, Commissioner Auerbach um, is leaving the department to go to a wonderful new opportunity at Northeastern University. And I'm here to thank him for his service and to wish him well as he goes forward. Um, we will miss you as the leader of public health in the state of Massachusetts, um, especially since you're also recognized nationally for your leadership. So um, this isn't on your program, but I really felt like I had to be here to thank John. This will be his last uh, ounce of prevention, at least in the role of commissioner. And I just wanted to um, highlight a, f a few of the things that John has accomplished and ask you to join me in celebrating his uh, service. John has spent more than 25 years in public service devoted to public health in one way or the other. Um, he's been commissioner since 2007 and uh, he took on a department that um, didn't look at as outwardly at public health issues um, as it had previously done. And in many ways, um, there were tough issues that needed to be addressed that um, weren't being addressed uh, up until 2007. John came into the department and not only set an agenda for the department, but for the public health of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. Um, with his leadership, um, I believe that the department uh, 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 held a vision for what we needed to do. Um, and he's been an incredible collaborator uh, with many of the other agencies in the Executive Office of Health and Human Services and really has educated almost every agency uh, of the 16 or 17 that are in our department about how their work intersects with public health. And he's been a champion of collaboration and getting rid of the silos that often prevent 
us from achieving what we can achieve um, if we just get out of our own way. Um, John reorganized the department to really acknowledge the fact that we know a lot more about how to do prevention and promote wellness um, that goes beyond advocating for a particular disease or condition, but really looking at the broad interventions that we know that work to improve the health of the public. John and I often had conversations about, well, if you think about it, the things that we want people to do in order to address heart disease are the same things we're asking them to do to prevent diabetes or cardiovascular disease or cancer. Uh, when John and I talked about women's reproductive health and we looked at the issues that uh, were confronting women, um, the range of things uh, that the department could do went beyond simply providing family planning services for women, but in the context of a state that has near universal coverage uh, of women, and men too, uh, and 99.8% of children covered, um, he really led the discussion about what can we do, given that now almost everyone has access to insurance, and what does that say about the, the role of the department? Um, and he continuously brought information to me to show how getting to near universal coverage has improved the health of the people of Massachusetts. It's not that we can just count how many people have insurance cards, but his department has been able to show um, that we can help people quit smoking when we cover that as a service. That for the first time in decades, the percentage of women who are getting adequate prenatal care has increased significantly. And when you think about that, it makes perfect sense. If you give women continuous coverage, get, guess what? When they do get pregnant, they can get to see a provider earlier. But it was John's um, steadfast support of health care reform and trying to measure the impact on the health of people um, that allowed us to celebrate not only that people are insured, but they're healthier. And he took that information and used it to craft a new way of thinking about what services and programs do we need in public health when you um, recognize that public health dollars that had previously filled in the gaps where medical care dollars failed um, can be repurposed to do real public health. So John initiated the Mass in Motion um, program, which I sure you all know about. Um, this program has expanded to more than 50 cities in the Commonwealth, um, and I recently reviewed some data that shows that in some of those cities we are seeing measurable improvements um, in the rates of obesity in kids and other measures. He took on the issue of emergency pre preparedness um, with abandon, and I think that we have one of the best uh, emergency preparedness bureaus in the United States. Um, we know that HIV infection um, in many ways at the core of John's early public health work um, has shown incredible progress in Massachusetts with the declining number of people who are infected with HIV and a narrowing of um, disparities and also again better health outcomes for people. Um, when I called John our back one weekend day, I, I will never forget this, I was uh, sitting in a bar, <laughs> having some oysters, and, uh, there were two, and watching a Red Sox game. Uh, but on the other screen, right next to the Red Sox, was CNN, and I saw this report about H1N1 in Mexico. And I went home that night, it was a Friday night, and I Googled some stuff. But I called John first thing on Saturday morning, and I said, are we paying attention to this? And he assured me that we were. And uh, his department um, was able to respond to that uh, new influenza in ways that um, made us all proud. I believe that we were one of the first state labs at the CDC allowed to actually do their own confirmatory testing. 
uh, so he can respond to emergencies um, in a way that really, again, puts the health of the Commonwealth at the forefront. I could go on and on about John's accomplishments. Um, they um, include, again, um, uh, addressing substance abuse and making sure that we have a breadth of programs available for people. Um, there's just not one treatment for it. We need a whole range, and John has been a strong advocate for that. Um, he established the Office of Health Equity within the department um, and has shown great leadership in making sure that even in these times of uh, limited resources, um, we can show we have a commitment to that. So, John, we're going to miss you as commissioner. Um, I want to wish you well um, in your new position at Northeastern. And I'm sure that I'll find a way to figure out how to keep working with you. Um, I want to thank you for your incredible leadership, your friendship, um, and your undying commitment to keeping people in Massachusetts healthy. And I hope that um, everyone will stand and help me thank John for this. <laughs>
and why he's been able to bring together so many people and to accomplish so much. Uh, so today we are here to say, John, you're the best. <laughs> In a role uh, presenting Dean Terry Fulmer from the Bube College of Health Sciences at Northeastern University, where I was a professor and associate dean uh, until very recently, last month. Uh, and I was also the director and founder of the Institute on Urban Health Research. So I'm here representing her and uh, want to convey on behalf of her and Northeastern and also the two interim uh, directors of the Institute on Urban Health, Professors Carmen Seppa and Elisa Lincoln. If they're here with us, they'll, if they'll, they'll stand up. So they're here also on behalf of Northeastern. <laughs> so I'm, I'm delighted to have a few minutes to share with you uh, in this tribute uh, to John um, and his remarkable history of contributions in public health in our state and nationally. Um, and uh, I, I came all the way from LA just to be here because I couldn't miss it. So, you know, during the last 30 year, three years, I've been here and I, I can remember meeting John early, early on uh, when I first moved here and working with him on issues of HIV, uh, addiction treatment, health disparities, um, uh, mental health, and uh, uh, trauma, domestic violence issues through, throughout the years. I met him shortly uh, in the, around the mid-1980s when the AIDS epidemic was really uh, uh, hitting us and we didn't know what was coming at us and uh, many of our friends and family members and leaders in the community were dying. And I, I'm sure many of you remember from that time period that we went from you know, one burial to the other. Um, and it was a, a quite an impactful time. Uh, I lost my own brother uh, early on in the epidemic, and that really convinced me to focus my attention on research that had application and, and that had, was useful to practice. And, and that's when I made, met John. Uh, he was director of the AIDS Bureau at that time, and then as you know, he went on to become uh, uh, director of the Boston Public Health Commission. Uh, he used to introduce me as his boss because uh, I served um, on the Boston Public Health Commission as the, uh, one of the uh, commissioners appointed by the mayor. But, you know, I have to tell you that we interviewed dozens of people who came from all over the United States who wanted this position. And when John applied, we knew he was, he was the right guy for the job. And, uh, and he proved us right. Uh, he did incredible things just when the Boston Public Health Commission was getting started um, and, and really placed it at a, in a national leadership position in, in the United States in terms of uh, what the, the department was doing. So, you know, I don't need to talk about all of his innovations and, and accomplishments. Dr. Bigby really covered that. But um, John is someone you want on your team. And that is why, beginning last October, when I was being recruited by the University of Southern California and thought it was likely that I would take the position, I started uh, courting John and introducing him to our new dean, uh, Terry Fulmer. She had just come on board last September. And we went out to dinner last October. And, and that's when it started. And uh, we had many meetings with him. We wanted him really to come on uh, uh, immediately. Uh, but John had made uh, being the, the loyal person and team member that he is, he'd made a commitment to Secretary Bigby and to the governor to stay till September. So we had to wait. Uh, but uh, it, it, um, we were um, delighted that, that he agreed uh, to take on the directorship of the Institute on Urban Health Research. Um, you know, as founder and first director of the Institute, I was able to establish the research base of the Institute, but John is going to take the Institute to a whole new level 
with the skills, uh, the relationships that he brings, the vision that he has. Uh, he will be working on a whole new set of initiatives that I think will place the Institute even in a, at a more mature level. Uh, I could not think of a better person to lead the Institute on Urban Health Research, and I'm delighted uh, that John, that John uh, and honored that he has agreed to take this role on. Um, I want to read a few words that the Dean sent um, on her behalf. Um, since she could not be here, she really uh, wanted to be here, but um, was not able to change her schedule. So here's what she said. We're thrilled that John Auerbach will be joining our dynamic institute on urban health research as the director and a distinguished professor of practice in the Bouvet College Department of Health Science. We know his impact will be felt across the university and the national public health community as we continue to generate and disseminate new knowledge related to improving the health of all of our citizens, including our most vulnerable by providing the highest health care and addressing the social determinants of health disparities. With over 30 years of extraordinary public health and leadership experience, John will take the Institute on Urban Health Research to new heights. We look forward to his leadership and scholarship, not only within the Institute and Bouvet, but also through the entire university. On a personal note, I am honored that John has agreed to partner with me to make Northeastern an even greater force for health equity and innovation. I am delighted to welcome him to Northeastern. So I hope you will join me in also welcome, welcome him, uh, welcoming John to his new role. And we know that he is, he may not be commissioner, but he's still going to be the public health leader in Massachusetts. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Amato. We really appreciate that. And um, now to, to conclude this impromptu uh, but carefully planned and secreted <laughs> tribute, uh, it's my, uh, my pleasure and, and, um, and distinct honor to welcome to the podium uh, a public health leader from the Commonwealth who has pulled together uh, tremendous programs uh, and staff and is serving uh, us at the department, serving many of your organizations and leading efforts to uh, promote public health around the country. And uh, also has strong relationships with uh, public health providers and advocacy organizations in the Commonwealth. And so to express uh, the gratitude of that community, which is this community, uh, I'm, I'm proud to uh, bring uh, Ray Considine, the President and CEO of Health Resources in Action, uh, to the podium. Ray? Well done. So, John, it's not over yet. <laughs> um, we have one more thing to do this morning, and um, now that we've heard from Dr. Bigby and, and Dr. Amaro, uh, those of us, as Jeff said, that have worked with you, John, um, in the prevention and the advocacy community, want to express our um, great admiration for you and I'm and, oh, sorry, and your great, uh, our great admiration for you and our thanks for your vision, your leadership, your compassion, and your tenacity in leading the Department of Public Health and making um, Massachusetts a healthier place to live over the past six years as commissioner, but really past 25 years in various roles that you've held in public health. So um, we know that you're leaving the department, but you're not leaving public health. And um, we know that we're going to continue to count on you, uh, count on your passion, your wisdom, and your leadership in your new position at Northeastern. And I will not go back and recite all the things that Dr. Bigby and, and, and Dr. Amaro have um, commented on, but. Um, you can see that, that it stands as a testimony to your uh, high esteem that we hold you in and the kind of successes that you've enjoyed that we have your colleagues here um, that are attending the Ounce of Prevention Conference today to uh, give you um, this, um, this plaque. I thought you were going to sing. <laughs> <laughs> That's one thing you do not want me to do. <laughs> oh, the after party. So, um, so on behalf of, of um, Marianne Mulligan, Karen Van Noonan, Cheryl Sabara, uh, Lisa Renee Olderby-Fox, Toby Fisher, and Maddie Ribble, and 
I hope I haven't missed anybody. Um, we are really, um, and there are many other colleagues that we've invited, but we're not able to be here tonight. Uh, and I'm sure that they will see you in, in subsequent events over the next couple of weeks. Um, but um, we want to present you from the provider and the advocacy community this, this, this plaque, if you'll come up here and, and I'll read it. Uh, John Auerbach, for your visionary leadership and unwavering commitment to improving public health in the Commonwealth 2012. So please join me wow. in congratulating John. And one more. And now we are resuming uh, the program. Uh, I'm, I'm going to um, make a few housekeeping comments. There are a lot of people to thank for this conference. And I'm going to start by thanking uh, our keynote speaker, who we will hear from uh, in a few minutes, but uh, Eduardo Sanchez, Dr. Eduardo Sanchez, who is the former health commissioner of Texas and now vice president uh, and chief medical officer at Blue Cross Blue Shield uh, from Texas, uh, joins us from Texas. And he'll be making uh, some remarks because he and John have worked very closely together in, in national circles. Uh, but we'll hold off on that, but thank you very much, Dr. Sanchez, for joining us this morning. I want to thank the planning committee for this conference. A lot of hard work has gone into this. Planning committee members, would you please stand and be recognized. Don't be shy. There are a lot of people who really particularly single out Jennifer Fahey from uh, AdCare, who's probably still at the table and welcomed many of you at registration, and also our own Kathy O'Connor, Director of the Office of Healthy Communities. Kathy, stand up again. She, she really managed this effort. Thank you to our exhibitors, and uh, I encourage you, if you didn't get a chance when you came into the hall, those exhibits will be up for most of the day. Uh, and there are breaks where I hope you'll uh, visit, visit our exhibitors. Thank you to you people who are uh, plenary presenters, moderators, facilitators, the human arrows who are going to help us all get to where we need to be on time. And I, uh, I promise to you we're going to get through everything today. Uh, we are running uh, a little late on the, on the schedule, but don't worry about it. We'll figure it out. It's going to be fine. Um, there is a list of planning committee members in your program, so uh, you can take a look at, at the, the Federal Needs. Affordable Care Act, which we have explored in detail in previous conferences, and which thankfully the Supreme Court upheld in June. <laughs> just, just six weeks later, Governor Patrick signed into law Chapter 224, our, our third major health care reform law in the Commonwealth. And so we see uh, on the state and the federal levels that uh, health care reform is uh, not only expanding access, but also trying to improve the quality of care and contain rapidly spiraling health care costs. Uh, we're moving away from a fee-for-service model of health care payment towards global payments. Uh, we are moving away from treatment silos towards integrated, integrated care. And these changes bring important new opportunities for us to link clinical and community prevention efforts, um, to bring medical care and public health together in ways that everybody in this room knows is critically important, but that a lot of our health system uh, doesn't quite understand, and a lot of our uh, partners in various sectors uh, don't fully understand. So there's a lot of work ahead of us. Our conference theme this year, Paving a New Way for Prevention, transforming the way we pay, play, and perform. We used together several important issues that we're going to be exploring in the conference plenaries and in our workshops today. First of all, we need to explicitly address racism in our organizations, in our health system. Uh, in order to improve health comes, we have to eliminate health disparities. So we're looking directly at that. And, you know, Dr. Bigby referenced health in all policies. We also need justice in all policies. So one of our plenaries will focus explicitly on that. Uh, second, place matters. The social environment, including education, employment, transportation, housing, safety, environmental quality, and access to healthy food and recreation, 
have dramatic impacts on health status and outcomes. Of course, these are themes that we've explored and even focused as the theme in previous conferences, uh, but we are picking that up again and we're going to be looking at that closely throughout the day. And finally, prevention pays. It makes economic sense to prevent injury and disease before they occur, despite the uh, imbalance ratio of our current health expenditures. We need to understand health finance better as a public health community. Uh, we need to take advantages of new opportunities in this changing health care reform climate. And frankly, we don't do so well. We don't know enough. Uh, and so we need to get more literate on these issues. And we've devoted one of the plenaries to the business case uh, for public health. So we're going to explore those and try to integrate those themes. These are all issues that Commissioner John Auerbach has championed in his quarter century of leadership uh, just in the public sector uh, in Massachusetts. Uh, he's a commissioner who needs no further introduction. Uh, the people who've preceded me on this stage have done a wonderful and, and fitting job of that. So it's my, it's my pleasure, my honor, to introduce my friend, uh, my commissioner, John Auerbach. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, th this certainly isn't how I thought the day was going to be uh, was going to begin. Um, I, I I have a very strict listing of the schedule and what things are supposed to occur at what time. And this none of the things that happened before this were on it. So I, you know we're we're way off schedule. Uh, I, I showed Jeff my uh, opening remarks uh, a couple of days ago, and he said, you know, they're kind of long. And I thought. <laughs> And I think what he was thinking is, you know, you've got like 30 seconds to speak because we're using your time for something else. So uh, thank, thank, thank you. Um, I, I would just want to start by saying a, a couple of things. You know, people have said nice things about me, but, but I, I, what I think is, is really true is uh, the degree to which you can work in, um, in governmental public health and all of you know this to work in government and public health, I think you know it in community agencies. The, the degree you can get things done in governmental public health at the local level, at the state level, at the federal level, really has to do with the leadership that appoint you, that support you, particularly the elected leaders. And, you know, and I've, I've, got, I've had to work, I've got, had the pleasure of working for just extraordinary leaders. You know, I think Mayor Menino is the best mayor in the country on public health. And, and I think that Governor Patrick is not only the best governor in the country on public health, I have to say, I think he's the best governor in the country, but that's a... <laughs> so I think having the opportunity to work for a governor with that, those commitments and his own values, which are about uh, equity and are about access uh, and justice and quality of care, I think it, it makes it very easy to be a health commissioner. And to be honest with you, when, when Governor Patrick was first elected, I thought the most obvious person for him to appoint as the Commissioner of Public Health was uh, Judy Bigby. I, I thought, you know, she's like, you know, she really is the expert on, on public health in the state. So to have someone like uh, Dr. Bigby as the secretary where she oversees all these different programs but also supports me has been, you know, just extraordinary. So. Um, so I, I really do uh, am incredibly grateful for the opportunity they both offered me. Uh, I also just want to say to, just for a minute how um, that you know it's not just obviously the elected officials, the governmental leaders that set the framework for us to be able to do work, but it's also many different kinds of organizations, local public health, community-based organizations, health centers, hospitals, but but universities can play incredibly important roles. And, and I, that's why I think I've been so um, honored to be uh, able to, to move to Northeastern uh, now. It, it, Northeastern's just a, a really extraordinary place, which believes very much in taking the strengths of academia, research, and teaching, and then connecting it, not in the future, but immediately into practice, into not only training the next generation, but also thinking about what can we learn from what's going on now? How can we evaluate that? How can we then make practice even better? And, and in terms of that model of working at the university level, there's just nobody in the country who's better than Hortensia Amaro 
Uh, I, I think Hortensia is the model for all of the people in the country who say, how can you work at a university level, do research, be at the top of your game in terms of teaching and research, and at the same time somehow be a grassroots community activist who is learning, teaching, you know, and building the capacity at the community level. So thank you, Dr. Morrow, for showing you could do it, that it can be done, <laughs> that, that universities are. Uh, And, and there's, there's a great, there are people here from the team, there's Elmer and Alyssa and Carmen, and I'm really happy to be joining you as partners. And uh, Dean Terry Fulmer, who, um, who Hortensia was quoting, is this extraordinary new uh, dean at Northeastern who just came from uh, NYU uh, several months ago and who, who is determined to make Northeastern the place to go when you think about health services training research, education, and activism. So she's, she's amazing, and I'm very happy to join that team and honored to do so. Um, I, I want to quickly, I, I'm really sorry for taking so long. I, I, I want to quickly just hit on what I think are, um, you know, some of the mix of feelings people may have now about where we are and, and you know, the balance of things. So, so this is where I think many of us feel. I mean, I think that many of us feel like the last five years have been tough. You know, uh, I don't think there's an organization here that's represented who hasn't had layoffs or cutbacks or lost programs or struggled around capacity. And, you know, it's been, and right now it's also, it's a time of transition too. We've got sequestration on the horizon, which could mean incredibly um, devastating federal cuts. Uh, you know, it, across the country, uh, we've got uh, you know we, we've got a, a, an uncertain election where really a lot of things are riding on the outcome of the election. We've got um, uh, you know continuing struggles, and, and it's always uh, people are always uncertain when there's a new public health commissioner because they're, they're wondering about what will that mean in terms of uh, the direction of the department and, and whatnot. There's this controversy around the horrible. Uh, activities that took place uh, by a chemist at the drug laboratory. So it is a tough time. And so, so I was thinking, I've been thinking about this a lot. There's like, you know, two different approaches in terms of how you can think about responding to the challenges and adversity. This is the one that comes to mind usually for me most often. <laughs> it's the panic, scream, this can't be happening, why aren't we able to focus on the issues that really count? <clears throat> but of course it's not that productive. Sometimes it's productive for you know, brief periods of time. Anybody who wants to leave now and go out to the parking lot and scream, <laughs> I would understand that and actually ought to join you. But, um, but, but it's not that productive. And, and so the really productive things, I think, are to reflect on you know, why we should be optimistic and why we have a lot of things that have actually been accomplished that have been unusual in Massachusetts. And, and I know that Eduardo, who, who's you know, you know, a national leader and sees things that are happening across the country, uh, you, you know, a lot of people think, oh my god, why do people in Massachusetts complain about anything? You know, you've got so many things that other states would um, value, you know, from healthcare reform to uh, a very, uh, relative to most other states, we have a really well-funded public health system. Here, we think about the cuts, but the rest of the country thinks, wow, you've got a lot going for you. <clears throat> and so, so I, I want to just highlight, thinking over the last five or six years, what are some of the advances that I think we've all been involved in as we've reflected on where public health has been and where it needs to go. And some of the things I just want to share with you where I think we are in a really good place and we are really well situated for optimism and future progress. Uh, healthcare reform, we just shouldn't forget this. Uh, you've seen this before, but you know, 98% of the population with insurance. There's no other state close. 91% of people say they have a doctor they've seen in the last year. Nobody else is even close to that. And, and, um, and th this is a chart which just shows that when, when people have those 98% of the people are actually getting preventive care from their doctors. They're getting some of the public health activities that normally people wouldn't get. Everything from immunizations to screenings to counseling around smoking. And those things are happening for the majority of people in this country. 98% of the people say, in fact, that, um, 
that for for a, a not younger than Medicare adults, that three quarters of those 98 percent of the people are seeing a doctor every year for preventive services. It's incredibly high uh, and unusual for the country. And now we've got payment reform with uh, Chapter 224. We're going to be talking more about that, but that gives us so much potential for us to transform the way that care is being offered here. I'm not going to go through this. Some of you have seen me do this slide before, but I'd highlight that third area, the gray zone. We actually have the possibility of transforming the way that care is provided so that comprehensive medical homes carve in, include behavioral health, mental health, and substance abuse on site, not as a separate system, where the care is uh, it treats the whole person in a holistic way and not just an organ, and where the teams are not just the traditional clinical teams who absolutely have to be there, but they include the expertise and the ability to bring people in that community health workers uh, can offer. So we are poised to be able to demonstrate to the rest of the country you can provide not just access to care, but access to innovative comprehensive and appropriate care that reaches out into the street, brings people in, and then works at the community level. And, and here I would just highlight, we've made, we put community health workers into the DNA of the way that we think about providing both clinical care and uh, public health care. And we need to really build on that. Uh, with the leadership of people like Lisa Renee and Jeff Wilkinson, we now have, we've had a commission report that has documented uh, every, uh, all the evidence that exists around the effectiveness of community health workers. We have, we're the first state in the country with a board of certification for community health workers. So community health workers can be certified just like nurses and pharmacists and doctors are with training, certificates, and professional development. That's an enormous achievement. And We'll soon have approved curricula, and we will have mechanisms through the accountable care organization structure where people can think about redesigning the clinical teams to make sure the community health workers are part of that. Another area where I think we've seen such change over the last six years is around the elimination of disparities in the promotion of, uh, the promotion of health equity. Um, I would say that, uh, you know, six years ago, ten years ago, people were talking about them, about these issues, but they were talking about these issues somewhat um, not as mainstream public health. And they were talking about them as, as um, uh, maybe pigeonholed into a, a few funded programs or a few specialized people. I, we have really moved to the point now where the work around the elimination of disparities has to be part of everything we do. Not separate programs, everything we do. I think there's more and more evidence that's happening. It's because the disparities do exist, of course. But here's just some examples. In, uh, under the leadership of Georgia Simpson May in our Office of Health Equity, the class uh, standards are part of what you, if you're going to be, get a contract from us, you have to demonstrate that you're uh, providing care in a way that um, respects that is reflective of the race, ethnicity, um, of the and language of the people you're caring for, and, and and agencies do this now and do it willingly and happily and skillfully. There's been lots of grassroots level work uh, with film showings and uh, community forums in the smallest towns to the biggest cities about how to make sure we're we're working on these issues, not in isolated ways, part of all of our work, and and so I. Uh, so, so I think we really have moved to a point now where it's not possible to talk about public health without talking about health equity. And it's also possible to think not just about health equity in terms of the, the key populations that we start with and focus so much of our attention on, those that are related to race and ethnicity, but also we are able now with data and with hard work and um, evidence-based programs to show that we have to focus on other populations as well, where we see that those disparities exist. And so now people are looking for the evidence for people with disabilities, for uh, gay, lesbian, bisexual, transgender populations, for the populations that are uh, low income, uh, gender related. We have, when we have the data, we can work on health equity and broaden our perspective while still keeping the focus on race and ethnicity. We've really moved ahead in terms of thinking about wellness. This is an area where we didn't have 
to be honest with you, hardly any money or focus five or six years ago when we started to think about this, even though we were seeing this terrible uh, trend in obesity and chronic disease as a result of it. But the Mass in Motion campaign has resulted in regulation so that all the children in the schools now get BMI testing confidentially relayed to their parents. As the Secretary said, the earliest funded programs for Mass in Motion are now, we have seen those communities have lowered the growth in terms of overweight uh, um, as measured by BMIs among children when compared with the communities that didn't start that early on Mass in Motion. So we've got hard evidence that it works. Um, and we've got more and more evaluations. We've got, um, we've got in New Bedford and Fitchburg model programs that are being uh, looked at comprehensively and evaluated for the rest of the nation. We've got workplace wellness programs and we've got grants to communities. We started with zero dollars for those. We got a million dollars in contributions from foundations and insurer. And now, now we're up to having uh, between eight and nine million dollars a year. Uh, in funding to allow us to fund uh, 50 different communities, and that's about a third of the population in the state are within those communities, and we're seeing incredibly innovative work. We've got, we've changed the school nutrition standards. They just went into effect. Fry layers out, low-fat options, fresh fruits and vegetables mandated, no sodas sold in schools any longer. That's throughout the state as of September. And we've got other approaches that are making a difference too, such as the head injury protections for sports in all schools. Great work is being done around tobacco uh, and innovative work now around uh, smoke-free housing. And, and, you know, it just has to be said, no other state in the country, no other state has anything like this part of Chapter 224, which is a four-year commitment to $15 million a year starting this year for innovative programs around prevention that are linked to provision of um, creating conditions in people's lives that will make them healthier and linking up to clinical care. Cheryl Bartlett's heading that work up for us and I think we're going to show uh, you have to do this while you expand access and then you really see dramatic changes in people's health. Uh, uh, we, we now know exactly what it means concretely to say health in all policies. It's not just a theory. It's you assign people, you specialize, you enter their culture, uh, you understand how to respect them and influence them, and it's happening with city and town planners around the country. It's happening with transportation projects. It doesn't happen automatically. It happens with work and focus, and I know scores of you are involved in making those changes, so we do have a health and all policy approach. And finally, uh, an area that had been neglected and neglected and neglected, and the 351 different communities, and the noble local health officials and boards who would strive to provide you know, all kinds of care just couldn't do it without support. They were seeing resources again and again being cut. And with a lot of leadership, again, Jeff did uh, the spearheading work, but also people throughout this audience also worked on these issues. We now have been able to get money to actually move us from a 351 different community approach to public health to clustered districts where people can pull their resources and do the kind of work that local public health has been wanting to do for a long time. And this just shows you some of where we're going in the state. This wouldn't have looked anything like that. The colors represent places where there are emerging districts and regions now where people share resources and work collectively to address the complicated public health issues. Um, MAVEN is our electronic uh, um, infectious disease reporting system now, which is making a difference for local health people because they get information about infectious disease immediately and they can share with the surrounding communities where appropriately immediately when they've got to uh, deal with an outbreak. And then this is just the last point I would say about local public health, and this is true of state public health and our community partners. We respond to emergencies all the time. And that historic, you know, I think maybe in 2001, when we were looking at 9-11, the emergencies we thought we'd be responding to were terrorist events. It, it turns out, fortunately, that we haven't had to anything like that, but what we have is we have every year multiple emergencies where we have the ability now, because people have worked at it and developed skills and have resources, to do incredible response. Whether it's tornadoes down the middle of Springfield or it's hurricanes that are affecting all parts of the state and it's floods in the Northeast, um, or even worrying about 
when there's a tsunami in Japan, is radiation clouds going? Are radiation clouds going to go over uh, and rain on um, the state? And are, you know, how do we make sure that we don't have our water or food contaminated? People have done extraordinary work on that, and, and, and highlight in particular the local public health. And then this year, you know, mosquitoes. So we've had uh, the, the worst um, uh, Triple E and West Nile virus year. In, in many, many years, with more deaths and more cases. And for months, I think that people, and particularly at the local level, were just doing incredible work to protect the public and to make sure that we were doing everything could, we could to minimize that. So really amazing work. That's the kind of work that people would have done in a, you know, they would have done their best, but it, it's not being done the way it, it would have been done in the past. Now it's done in a sophisticated, coordinated, evidence-based way, and those are really reasons for optimism. Finally, I'd say, as I mentioned earlier, really amazing leadership across the state, another reason for optimism. This is true of the elected leaders, it's true of our grassroots organizations, our governmental public health at all level, our faith-based community. We've got the resources in the state to be optimistic. You are a reflection of that. Your leadership, your commitment today to the workshops and to learning the lessons, I think is an uh, incredible reason for optimism. And then just finally, I would say, the fact that the ounce of prevention is, has been as successful as it has the last five years after it went into hibernation for four years, five years, uh, we, we didn't have this conference until well, this, is the fifth, this is the fifth in its second life uh, because it kind of died out. And that meant for four years, no focus on prevention in, in, this, in this way. There was obviously work that was being done, but nothing that brought people together in this way. So I would say the fact that we've got a, a well-attended uh, ounce, of uh, ounce of prevention today, the fact that you're participating, the fact that you're, it's all about the work that you're doing um, that uh, has brought you to the table today. I think just lots of reasons for optimism. So all that is to say, for, uh, personally, thank you for all of you. I, I know a lot of you personally and professionally. Thank you for being wonderful partners to me. Thank you for educating me and supporting me. And, and thank you for um, uh, uh, criticizing me and telling me what I needed to do better and helping us to try to reshape the department so that it could be more reflective of what the objective needs of the population was. Uh, I don't, uh, I feel, sometimes I feel like I'm attending my own uh, memorial service. <laughs> and, and, and by the way, it's just as an aside on that, I, I feel that, I, I often feel that way now, but, but uh, I, I've driven to this building like 50 times. I've been to like how many scores of, of conferences. This morning I got lost and, 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 and I made a wrong turn. I thought I was turning the right way and I ended up in a cemetery. <laughs> I was in a cemetery, a dead-end cemetery, and I thought, I really hope this is not symbolic. <laughs> but, uh, but anyway, I was able to find my way out of the cemetery and stop at a gas station, and I thought, how can I get lost coming here? Um, so all that is to say, I, even though I'm changing jobs, I, I, I'm so excited about being at Northeastern. I'm so excited about the potential to continue to work on all the public health issues I've worked for as commissioner. So I look forward to coming to the Ounce of Prevention next year. I look forward to continuing to work with all of you in a new way uh, in the coming years. And again, I just want to say thank you, thank you, thank you for being such wonderful friends and partners. and he spent many years as a family practitioner and, and serving the population and I think that, that his compassion and his skill and his understanding of what, how you can have an impact on, on families and people's lives uh, through clinical care, the clinical care that's linked to population health is based upon his own uh, practice and experience. He then 
uh, went on to become uh, the director of public health and uh, and health for uh, the state of Texas. Uh, and, and you know, for those of you, you know, or as a reminder, uh, if you put Massachusetts into Texas, we'd be like one little county. We'd probably be a small county in here, Texas. And you know, in terms of the population, and in terms of the challenges, Texas is an incredibly uh, 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 complicated state to, to attend to in terms of public health. And, you know, universally people say that Dr. Sanchez was uh, just an, an amazing leader and that he made, uh, a, had a long legacy in terms of the, uh, improving the health of the people of Texas. Um, he currently serves as the um, medical director and vice president of Blue Cross Blue Shield of Texas. Uh, and in that role has again taken on the mantle of someone who thinks about what you can do as an insurer, what you can do in, uh, as a major coverer of care to think outside the box, excellent high quality care but also linked to the conditions in people's lives. But I think more than uh, those positions, I, many people don't think of Dr. Sanchez as actually um, uh, working for Blue Cross Blue Shield, frankly. I think most, most people think of him as being the, you know, the, the public health icon for the country, the conscience of the country, the outspoken leader who says what needs to be done in terms of the way that we need to redesign our systems, both clinical and public health, so that they reflect what the needs of the population are. Uh, and he plays that role in scores of different settings. Uh, he advises uh, the leaders in the federal government, from the CDC leaders to other leaders at H uh, Health and Human Services. He leads the uh, uh, circles of insurers and carriers around the country. Uh, people in public health know that when you need to hear the truth, the unvarnished truth, and you need guidance about where we need to go in the future, you call on Dr. Eduardo Sanchez. Dr. Sanchez. this state. Um, I am very hopeful, but I still want to go outside and scream because I, I do come from Texas and we do have some challenges. I know you were struggling. That's the word you wanted to use. Um, it's a challenging state. I'm in the state with the highest rate of uninsurance in the United States of America. There are more uninsured people in the state of Texas than there are people in the whole state of Massachusetts. So we have a huge, huge, huge challenge. Um, sobering, isn't it? Um, there, 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 there are some things, though, before I start that I want to say about John. Um, I have had the opportunity to work with John at the national level. Um, he served as the president of ASTO, uh, the Association of State and Territorial Health Officials, at the same time I was serving as president of the ASTO Alumni Society. And so on behalf of all the former uh, state health officers, we will be welcoming you to the club and expecting your, um, your check um, to be a part of the club soon. Um, it is my opinion it's that... Mailed. Um, thank you, sir. Um, that's what they all say. Um, it is my opinion that those of us who have done this state health officership and then moved to other places, whether it's the health plan world or the academic world or other governmental um, uh, appointment opportunities, we have a different voice and perhaps even a stronger voice collectively than do those who are the incumbent or the actual state health officers. There's things we can say that we couldn't say when we were state health officers and we bring perspectives um, that I don't believe have been fully tapped. And uh, John and I were talking earlier about there is, there is definitely some work to do. Um, one of the, the theme that I would like to sort of leave you with is that we all need to be talking about one health system. And that health system has a part that does medical care and that medical care system depends a lot on another part that does public health. And that we still haven't completely defined public health, but I'll talk a little bit more about that. <clears throat> John and I also served together um, on a small advisory committee that was put together by the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. And I think among the things that we suggested to the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation was 
you must be the voice for this notion that we've got to talk about one health system. Um, it is the only way we'll get to where we need to get. And again, I'll try to make those points in my, in my comments. Um, John has been a leader, clearly at the local level, clearly at the state level, at the national level when he was ASTO president. Um, health equity was his issue that he brought and championed, and I think that has been a great thing for an organization called ASTO, and I think it will be work that the ASTO Alumni Society can continue um, pushing forward and doing work on. Um, and so, along with everyone else, let me just ask everyone, please stand up again, and let's give John a round of applause um, for all the work that he's done. some contrasts, it, to be a little bit light, between our two states. And actually, for those of another part of my bio, I got to spend four years in Boston, Massachusetts, um, uh, studying at Boston University. And it was a wonderful, wonderful part of my life. A little too cold for me, but it was a wonderful, wonderful part of my life. Um, at the time, I wrote a paper where I, at, at, uh, you know, introductory English paper where I contrasted Austin and Boston and had a great time doing it. I can't say that I remember much of it, but in that spirit, some things, some differences, uh, um, or, or differences. Uh, Massachusetts, great chowder. Texas, great barbecue. Um, Massachusetts, great college hockey. Uh, Texas, great college football. Although, man, University of Texas got spanked this weekend. You know, I got invited. Don't be raising your hand. Um, I'm your guest. Um, I went to the game, and uh, oh my gosh, before the first half, whatever energy people from UT had was completely just sapped, and lots of people left early. Um, Y'all had the New England Patriots. And we have the Dallas Cowboys. That would be a thumbs up for y'all and a thumbs down for us. Dallas is uh, not delivering these days. Uh, y'all have the Boston Red Sox. Sorry, y'all had a pretty tough year. Um, we have the Texas Rangers. We had a pretty tough end of the year, end of the season. Oh, my God, we were, we were poised to uh, repeat and maybe be in a World Series again. And um, we imploded in the last two weeks of the season. Um, Great running along the Charles is something I grew to love and continue to love when I had the opportunity to do it when I visit um, uh, Boston. A great running along Lady Bird Lake in Austin, Texas rivals it except in July when it's 100 degrees. Bad news. Um, and in that spirit, you all have great fall colors and we have hot as hell summers. Um, so. A few years ago, or actually it was about a year and a half ago, I was invited by NACHO to be one of the uh, keynote speakers. And um, I used the theme of A Tale of Two Cities uh, to talk about the notion of A Tale of Two Systems at the time. And there are some contrasts, again, that continue between our two states. Uh, I heard earlier, y'all have almost universal health coverage. And as I stated to you, we have the highest uninsurance rate in the United States of America. Um, um, I heard a commitment to women's health uh, in the state of Massachusetts. Uh, just read the newspapers about Texas and you'll get a sense. And there is um, an organized effort to try to make clear that this women's health issue and reproductive rights issue is a public health issue. It's about health. It's not about politics, it's not about ideology, it's about health, and we're trying to frame the issue that way. I think one of the other contrasts is that in the state of Texas, um, all issues have to be started um, and introduced with the business case. It's not enough to say this is the right thing to do. It's not enough to say this is going to save lives. It's not enough to say this is healthy. You've got to start with the business case, and I've gotten a little bit, um, I've gotten pretty good at doing that. Because in the health plan world, you have to make the business case as well. And the business community, which I think is one of the um, elements that we've all got to figure out, those of us who care about 
not only public health, but the public's health. We've got to figure out how to take this message to corporate America and help them understand they don't get it. Better doctors and better hospitals and better meds, they're good, but it's not going to fix the challenges that we're facing in terms of health status, in terms of health disparities, and some of the other things that I'll be talking about. So as a nation, we're facing some challenges. Um, and you face those challenges in Massachusetts, perhaps not as acutely as we do in the state of Texas. Um, poor health status that seems to be getting worse, at least nationally, maybe not in some states. High medical care costs, I don't think that uh, Massachusetts is immune from those. And then the business case is that our competitiveness is slipping globally and the ability at the local level and even at the state level to attract business. And those of you who are in state government, I know you have an economic development agency, and that economic development agency is about making the business case for why businesses would come to Massachusetts. I would say universal coverage is probably something that works in your favor, despite the high cost, whereas in my state, it will eventually be a real uh, detriment to not have more people covered and to have such a, rate, uh, such a high rate of uninsurance. Um, one of the business case messages uh, comes this way. Um, employees with poor health status have higher medical care costs, but also their productivity is um, not what it could be. Higher absenteeism, higher um, presenteeism. So a healthy workforce is one that brings increased productivity and I like to say smarter if not lower medical spend. Because while I believe in the value of prevention, I think sometimes we tie ourselves up when we try to make the case that, va that, that prevention is absolutely a cost saver. Um, some prevention, absolutely a cost saver. Some prevention is at least cost neutral. Some prevention is um, costs a little bit. But I'm going to go back to the first slide here. Prevention is generally better than treatment. And I like to use this um, way of thinking about things. Being alive is generally better than being dead. And then given the being alive, it's generally better not to have a disease than to have a disease. Therefore, prevention should prevail. Um, that's the kind of thinking and the way you have to spell it out for um, some of our elected officials who only understand terms monosyllabically. <laughs> and please, you know, I've now learned there's this thing called Twitter and people write things down. Don't Twitter that line. <laughs> it's, just, it's just not even worth putting out there. Now, water on both sides. I'm really well covered now. Um, thank you, Jeff. And I do want to say, I had the opportunity last night to uh, have dinner with uh, some of the folks who are here now, Cheryl, Ray, um, Jeff, uh, John stood us up. Um, I'm joking. Actually, I saw John yesterday at a conference we were both at in, um, in Maryland, and I learned that he was leaving later than I was because he was presenting, so I didn't watch him present, and he didn't come to dinner with me. We're even. Um, <laughs> I speak to large employers, and large employers are all about, we want to reduce medical spend. Um, sometimes not understanding that the very fact that people who work for them age from one year to the next, and I think I have a slide that will show you that just aging increases medical spend, right? Um, but they're about, how do we go about reducing medical spend? And there's a couple of ways. On the supply side, reduce the cost of care. And health insurance companies um, try, they, they do try, to say to providers, we're not paying you any more this year than we did last year, and trying to find ways to pay less. Um, improving the efficiency of care, and we certainly heard about the $765 billion that the IOM says is just uh, maybe um, money that's injudiciously spent in our system. Um, figuring out how to spend less of that is much easier to say, I think, than it is to do. But, but it is uh, something that, that all of us are striving to do in our various parts of the system. 
And then on the demand side, increase the cost of care. And, you know, those are the strategies that say, well, if you just have to pay a little bit more out of pocket, then you will be smarter about how you use your health care dollar. That can be taken to extremes, and we know that when done injudiciously, um, people will seek less preventive care because they feel like it's going to cost them too much, and the bargain, at least in their minds, is one that doesn't have prevention prevailing. And I think that two that seem not to be at the table as much as they ought to be are strategies to improve health and to prevent disease. Because as I think about something I heard this morning that says that although it's uh, I think it's, uh, 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 I may get the numbers wrong, but I think it's 50 million people today are on Medicare, and um, in, in the next 30 years that's going to go up to 80 million people. The only way that we can hold um, ground in terms of a system that doesn't completely collapse is to figure out how we keep people who are in their 20s, 30s, 40s, and 50s healthier, 60s, 70s, and 80s healthier, so that the demand for medical care is reduced somewhat. That's where public health comes in, I think. So you've seen this list. I'm not going to go over it, the uh, leading causes of death in the United States. What strikes me about this list and should strike all of us is there are a number of things on this list that we know are preventable and or delayable. Now there's that argument that says, well, we're all going to die of something. I'll talk about that in a little bit. There's a different way of thinking about things, not just what kills us, but what costs us and what's driving medical care costs in the United States. And again, what this list shows is that there are some things here that are absolutely on the delayable and or preventable uh, part of the ledger. And it behooves us to figure out if we prevent these things, can we reduce uh, cost in the long run in a way that has a healthier population living um, longer, um, but a longer, um, healthier life and reduce or, or, or what we call squaring the curve. And I'll talk about that in a minute. There's a couple of other things I want to point out that are on this slide. One is that there are some things here that don't ordinarily show up on a morbidity slide, not directly. One is mental disorders. Um, and John touched, sorry, I got all emotional there. John touched on this uh, issue of integrating mental health and substance abuse care into primary care. And one of the things I was going to say is at dinner last night, all we did was talk about kind of health system issues. And um, it's only because at home, at dinner at night, all I talk about is health system issues. My wife is a social worker, a PhD social worker, whose area of research and interest is the integration of behavioral health into primary care. And, and frankly, that's another one of those things, like it or not, we have to figure that out. That's where people go, that's where they want to get their care, and one of the areas of interest that my wife has is around the disparities, not only of care, but how people want their care. And it turns out that Latinos, that's where she's doing some of her work, would rather have that care provided in a primary care setting, not being referred to a psychiatrist. So we've got to take those kind of things into account and, and deal with them. The other one is osteoarthritis that I want to point out to you, and that's because osteoarthritis generally doesn't kill people, although it is a pain in the neck or a pain in the knee uh, that some of us suffer and work through every single day. And now that I've gotten to sort of the 50 plus years, uh, there are joints I didn't realize um, you could feel um, unpleasantly um, for as long in the day as I seem to these days. Um, and, and it doesn't necessarily kill, but it absolutely drives cost, and it's absolutely worsened by obesity. So again, there may be a prevention, delayable, or mitigation uh, strategy that one could put into play. Same goes for back problems. Um, Blue Cross Blue Shield experience, not much difference in terms of cost. I'm going to try to go a little bit faster now. Um, the cost of care. This is a dated slide. If, if you move that slide up a little bit, you'd, you'd, you'd have today's numbers. But the bottom line is that when you do reach about 50 years old, for lots of reasons that we could understand, the cost of care seems to go up. Now, I will suggest to you there may be a way to flatten that curve a little bit. I'll get there later. I know you've seen this slide or some like it, the preventable causes of death in the United States, and this is just a reminder that there is a lot of work we could do to reduce um, um, the, the, the use of or the um, behaviors that contribute to 
um, preventable disease and preventable death. Um, and they're not the sorts of, they are the sorts of things that public health is all about. High blood pressure, I think, turns, uh, becomes, it enters the realm of public health because although 30% of the population has high blood pressure in the United States, 50% of those individuals do not have their blood pressure controlled. And when I think about community health workers, um, in Dallas, Texas, some really interesting research has been done, and I think it's in other places as well, where barbers were basically turned into community health workers. And barber talking to uh, Bubba or Leroy is more effective at getting Bubba or Leroy to think about what to do about their blood pressure than other forms of persuasion. And when we think about motivational interviewing and those sorts of techniques about behavior change, it's not just the message. Um, it may very well be the messenger is part of how we need to think about that. We certainly know that that's the case generationally. Um, my kids don't want to be talked to. They want to be texted to. Now, what I haven't figured out as a parent is should I, um, should I um, discipline them uh, by text as opposed to <laughs> screaming at them in anger. Um, and that may be worth pursuing because I may be more effective than I am now. Um, now what's interesting about this, this also, this graph, is that it shows you um, in, in, in graphic form uh, to what these um, uh, behaviors and or lack thereof contribute to in terms of the disease categories and that's what these hash marks and colorations are. Now, this is a slide that I love to show these days, um, and it's a slide that I think uh, a John Arbach and people in this audience um, are all about. Um, the, the, the reference is there, and it's the relationship between social determinants called social factors in the article and mortality. And the notion is that there is excess mortality caused by some of these social determinants. They're not just some, some thing that says, oh, some people are poor and they live in poor neighborhoods. It, it, is, it, it says people are poor or undereducated, and it actually contributes to premature, early, and excess death. Premature and early, same word, but I said them both for emphasis. Um, this is something we cannot ignore. And I've been trying, um, when I speak to employers, when I speak to, at health plans, to say, understand that there are some individuals who are insured um, for whom this dis is a descriptor. This describes them. They're low, they, they, they may be um, undereducated. They may live in neighborhoods uh, that are uh, racially segregated um, or, or poor neighborhoods. They, they have jobs and they have insurance. But, but just having the insurance card doesn't change this, and this is a predictor of poor health. And unless we focus on this while we focus on the health system stuff and the medical care stuff, I don't believe we can make the kind of headway that we believe we ought to be making as it relates to the elimination of any health status disparities and the achievement of full health equity. And oh, by the way, in my opinion, um, you, you, you're not even, the, the notion of equity in general cannot be, um, uh, uh, um, cannot be um, achieved, um, cannot even be commenced upon without doing something about low educational attainment and the disparities in graduation rates in the United States of America. So I'm in a state where already whites represent less than 50% of the general population. In the school systems, um, substantially less than 50%. And where yet the emerging uh, population of non-whites is not graduating from high school. And as I think about what are the health challenges, you know, Cancer Institute, um, Heart Institute, even um, traditional public health, I'd rather um, see money going to improving these graduation rates up to 70 and 80 percent equal to those of, Afri of uh, Asians and whites. Here's why. Y'all are public health folk, and these are things that people just, they, and, and I've, I've looked at these statistics over and over because I sometimes don't believe them myself. And that is that the mortality rate for individuals who have less than a high school education uh, for people 18 to 64 years old is more than twice as high. These are um, like, uh, these are estimated numbers because the real numbers, I still go back and look, they're there. 
the real, is, is more than twice as high as the mortality rate for individuals with one year of education beyond high school. One year of education. Um, it can be a vocational school. It can be one year on one's path to an associate degree. And, 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 and I think what that says is that not graduating for high school is a marker of, in general, not having the critical thinking skills that it takes to make good decisions in life, including healthy behavior uh, decisions. Uh, there's evidence out there that individuals who graduate from high school less likely to smoke, um, more likely to be physically active, less likely to be immoderate users of alcohol, how much money you make. Um, it is really, really important to graduate from high school. Uh, these are numbers from uh, the Bureau of Labor Statistics. They're 2010 numbers, but it's not only how much money you, you make, but it's also the likelihood that you will be unemployed during a recession. And these are numbers from 2008, I believe. In Texas, just like everywhere else, we have diabetes. But in Texas, just like everywhere else, there is a uh, despair, there is disparate prevalence of diabetes. And I put this up here because one of the things about Texas that we know is that if we project forward to the year 2040, the burden of disease is going to be quite large. Uh, but the burden of that disease is going to be more borne by Latinos. Because by the year 2040, not only will Latinos be more than 50% of the population, but they have a higher prevalence of diabetes. Not as high as African Americans, but substantially higher than that of whites. That burden of disease will cripple our state's ability to manage the resources it has in a productive way. Because those dollars will be about managing disease, a disease that at best can be prevented and at worst can be delayed. The evidence is very compelling uh, that diabetes can be delayed. But it forces us to think about this notion of place matters. And when you know that zip code could be more predictive of health status issues than someone's disease, it says maybe we're not thinking about all of the right things when we consider what sorts of interventions and to whom we ought to direct those interventions. There is the issue in America that keeps sort of um, uh, um, manifesting itself as this personal responsibility discussion. Oh, we don't need a nanny state. People just aren't responsible. Never mind that when you get in a car, you have to have a license, you have to follow the rules that are listed all over the place. There's signage to tell you every place you are as you go from one block to the other. Cars are designed in a way that will keep you from hurting yourself, even if you try to hurt yourself. And we want to say, well, but when it comes to the choices around tobacco, eating, and physical activity, we're just going to leave it to you to figure it out. It seems a little bit crazy to me, particularly when I think about the fact the likelihood of death from something other than motor vehicle accidents is fairly high. And the opportunity to figuratively create the licensing, create the signage, create the, 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 the means by which we can protect ourselves, otherwise known as changing our built environment and using policy change to make the healthy choice the default choice and frankly to make the unhealthy choice um, a really challenging thing to accomplish, um, I say, why can't we think about that? But let's get back to personal responsibility. Is it fair to say, and I like to tell, remind people, I was a clinician, so I was someone who had that patient who would say to me, uh, Mrs. Gonzalez or Mr. Jones might say to me, Dr. Sanchez, um, I know we're doing everything we can to take care of, of my diabetes, but um, the food you think I ought to eat and the dietitian said I ought to be eating, um, A, it's really hard to get it because I have to travel on a bus to get to the store. I can only bring so much home. It seems to uh, rot quicker than I can consume it. And as for going outside, um, the gunshots that I hear every now and then just keep me from wanting to go outside or even the children who are riding their bikes on the same sidewalks that I'm going to walk on make me feel like it's a bit precarious. Or the sidewalks don't exist, or the sidewalks are all cracked up, and at night, in the wintertime, there's no lighting and I, I, I just can't get out. Now is that 
Mr. Miss Gonzalez or Mr. Jones' fault? Um, I, I don't know. I don't know that I can blame them for not being able to do some things that probably most of us in this room would conclude can't be done. Do we need to think about strategies that, that make it easier for those folks to do those things? So here's the list. I'm not going to go over it. I think the bottom one I want to focus in just for a second, this notion of limited time and knowledge of food preparation that can increase demand and consumption of prepackaged or processed foods. I do think that we need to broaden the conversation um, overall about health literacy and that health literacy should be more than just um, whether you can read a prescription or understand what your doc says and that the strategies have to be more than docs figuring out how to talk to people at a level that their patients can understand. It absolutely must include the ability to navigate in the world today and understand that you can walk into a supermarket with dollars in your pocket and walk the aisles, make smart choices and walk out with a basket of healthy food and some money in your pocket. Um, and that the messaging that we get has to be filtered out, um, and part of health literacy is learning how to filter out the thousand messages we get a day about buying, pardon my language, crap, um, as opposed to the, any messages that may come that say we need to purchase healthier food. And I, I do want to say I am soft-spoken and I don't have strong opinions. <laughs> Soft-spoken like John Auerbach. You, you're amazing. You, you say some powerful things in a soft-spoken way. Um, I'm from a family of uh, talkers, and believe it or not, I'm the one who has to struggle the most to talk over my dad and my brothers and sisters. So um, I, I, I just am a screamer because I have had to learn that way. Um, I do think this is an important slide. Achieving optimal health. And maybe an important statement for me to make. I consider myself, and I think I, I hear channeled through what I heard in terms of what John is and what y'all do, I'm a health activist. And I don't mean that like a health activist about let's all put on our running suits and go run. I mean about health for all, optimizing health for all. And I think that we need to change the conversation in our country from access to health care to access to health access to health, because it's not enough. It's not enough to have the card. And, and, and I applaud, I applaud what has happened in Massachusetts. But I would say to you, you've gone beyond just the card. You've gone to that place that says, how do you think about the gray zone? How do you think about that, that, that one system approach to optimize health? Y'all are thinking about it, so it gets you to that place. And most of our other states, it's just about the card. And this crazy notion that if we just do medical care better, suddenly everyone's going to be healthy. It's not unlike the Wizard of Oz. It is not about, um, it is not about the wizard. Um, it is about something way simpler than that. Values, and one of those values is prevention and public health. So we need to think about some non-clinical strategies, and it sounds to me, y'all are all over these things that Brian Smedley's pointed out. Um, coordination of relevant agencies and organizations, finding ways to think about these community-based and neighborhood issues, uh, promoting community-level interventions, I heard it. Um, School-based strategies, I'm a big believer in using coordinated school health not only to reverse childhood obesity, but the evidence is very compelling out of a program called Catch in Texas that coordinated school health is not only reversing childhood obesity, but those schools that have adopted Catch are seeing better academic performance and children behave better in the classroom. Um, you know, there's that dumb moment, um, um, particularly boys. Uh, who tend to be a little wild at times, um, getting out and moving their bodies is really important. Not to mean that girls don't need it. I don't mean to be sexist at all. The evidence is pretty compelling that the boys benefit from the physical activity stuff more than the girls. And too many, many of us do ends of one. The end of one, this young boy, um, had I not had the opportunity to um, go out and move my body when I was in school, I guarantee I wouldn't be up here talking to you. I'd be behind bars talking to nobody. Um, um, it was a way for me to burn some energy and be able to pay attention in the classroom. People way smarter than me have said, we've got to figure out 
how to shift our care system from a curative model to something that's different than that, where we look at the evidence-based environmental, regulatory, and behavioral interventions that make a difference at the population and individual levels. Our national quality strategy for quality health improvement includes similar language. Here's an important point, though. Read this third bullet, and I'll just start supporting proven interventions to address behavioral, social, and environmental determinants of health in addition to in addition to delivering high quality care. High quality care necessary, not sufficient. We've got to do the other things. Now I've gotten the 10 minute sign. So I'm a lover of Southwest Airlines um, and this is going to be a little bit like Southwest Airlines. So um, we're going to pick up all the beverages and things, turn off your power, uh, your power machines and we're coming in for a really fast hard landing here. Um, I'm not going to talk about this framework but I would encourage you to look at it. Um, it. We need to be looking at the left side of this, creating the social and environmental conditions that are favorable to health. Because if we did that, we, could, um, we would see increased in, an increase in healthy behaviors, a decrease in risk factor profile, lower disease, and good quality of life until death. I know you've seen this before, the chronic care model, but I want to focus on this as we come to a close. Healthy people do healthy things. And one of the conversations that John and I have had is when you sit down at the table and you're trying to figure out how do we move and the health system forward in this unified way, people just say, ooh, it's too complicated, I can't do it. And I want to suggest to you there may be a way to simplify at least the beginnings of some first steps. Study done by Yang, presented in JAMA, looked at seven heart health factors. In fact, these are the seven heart health factors that um, the Heart Association has identified as life simple seven. Uh, there they are. And what this shows you and, uh, is that mortality, uh, relative mortality, goes down as those seven heart health factors um, are more and more descriptive of a population. To me, that says, okay, um, if I was going to... Um, try to think about where do we start. I might start with these seven heart health factors. Um, three of them are absolutely in the realm of how do we find non-clinical solutions for them. Four of them are in the realm of you need some sort of an interaction to measure them, but at the end of the day, the very three things at the top are part of the treatment strategy if you identify a problem. Now, what's even more interesting is that someone else looked at four cancers, lung, colon, prostate, breast cancer. The incidence of each of those cancers goes down as the seven heart health factors go up. If you think about the diabetes prevention program, what's the basis of it? Healthy eating, physical activity, and um, healthy weight, three of the seven. When you think about diabetes care, what are the three essential elements of diabetes care? Normalized blood sugar, normalized blood pressure, and normalized lipids. Um, three of the seven. It seems to me we can embrace those seven heart health factors as seven health factors to promote. How many of y'all have heard of blue zones? So, blue zones. Blue zones are these places in the world where people seem to live um, at a higher prevalence into their hundreds, certainly into their 90s and into their hundreds, and there's five that have been identified. Here are nine principles for blue zones. Um, and I'm not going to go through, I'm going to go through these real quickly because we are coming in for a landing. Move naturally means that in these places, moving your body is part of every day whether it's walking to work or working in, in, your, in, in the fields, whatever it may be. Know your purpose is um, uh, that, that, that affirmation I made about being a health activist. What is it that motivates you as an individual day to day? And these were individuals that had that kind of motivation, whatever it was. Downshift is don't live like I do. Live um, in first and second gear, not fifth gear going 120 miles an hour. The 80% rule is know what being completely full is and when you eat, only eat up to 80 80% of that. 
Plant slant is more fruits and vegetables and legumes in your diet. Wine at five is moderate use of alcohol, but the wine at five part is rather than slamming it down in a corner by yourself, share and have, um, make it about a social event. Now, people in Loma Linda, California, I need to say, uh, only Seventh-day Adventists enjoy kind of that blue zone, and um, they don't drink. Um, family first, I think that one speaks for itself. Belong is about faith communities. The evidence was that of close to 600 people, only about 10 of them did not belong to a faith community. And then Right Tribe is about being in the right social networks. John is joining the ASTO Alumni Society. He'll be in the right tribe. <laughs> Now, there's also healthy communities that have the elements that enable health, and I'm not going to go through these except for one thing, last bullet, access to public health services. You've seen the research, I hope, by Mays and Smith that says spending on public health leads to declines in preventable deaths, and I would say to you that's tip of the iceberg. That probably is representative of decrease in morbidity and certainly some other aspect of blue zone uh, achieving some blue zone things when you do that, but that research is yet to be done. And so I'm going to finish with two, two, two places to focus on. One, as I think about the, 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 the gray zone, where do things come together? I'm chair of something called the National Commission on Prevention Priorities. It looked at clinical preventive services and ranked them by health impact and cost effectiveness. I would say that a great strategy for public health is to get at the table with medical care delivery system folk and say, listen, if you had to do 15 things first, because we can't do them all at once, or 10 things first, Here's the list of 10 things that we ought to be doing, and we'll help mobilize the population to get this done. Now, y'all have done a great job in Massachusetts, and you don't have that much room for improvement in terms of preventive services, but there's always room for improvement, right? I mean, I'm in a state where 60 to 70 percent is something to pat yourself on the back about. It sounds like y'all are, like, uh, getting close to and sometimes exceeding 90 percent. And I'm going to leave with this. Um, there is tremendous opportunity that's been looked at for how public health and medical care can work together. Back um, almost uh, 20 years ago, David Satcher brought men, med, uh, managed care organizations and, and prevention and, and public health people together. We have skills and competencies that we can bring to the table. Epidemiology, we know data, we understand how to engage community, and, and a whole host of other things. Um, med, med, managed care organizations have their skills and competencies, and I would say that together we can do more. Um, in Texas, we've done some work. I'm going to leave you with this idea, and there's some slides with some other stuff. We need to start talking about accountable health organizations um, as opposed to accountable care organizations. As long as we are using words that are about transactions, um, I don't believe we will move away from a sort of a fee-for-service way of thinking about things. We may not pay it that way, but it's still going to be transactional. And I think that we need to begin thinking how um, using some of the leadership that I think John has provided in this state, um, you can serve as an example of how you bring public health and medical care to the same table not to say that there isn't work to be done in this state and in all the others, and begin thinking about how do you manage the investment in health portfolio for a community. This notion of health in all policies and the penultimate bullet point, how do you develop the attribution methodologies, and I think we can help with that along with academics, that says when you, when you are something that brings a health promoting or a disease preventing activity to the table. Let's figure out how we can evaluate that and then um, make sure you're getting funded to do it. Um, now, I don't think it needs to start that way right at the beginning. Let's have some faith that public health actually works. It did work with tobacco. Um, it does work with alcohol and substance abuse. Let's have some faith that it can work, put some dollars on the table, test our hypothesis. But we've got to be thinking about accountable health organizations. Some other folks are doing the same thing. And here is where I think this is the last slide, where there are some opportunities and some things that we need to keep doing. Make the case for public health. I don't think we need to be, um, we don't need to be apologists. It's not about apology. We bring real value to the table. 
um, 40 years of, um, of added, 30 years of added longevity from 1900 to 2000 did not happen because we built a whole bunch of medical care centers in this country. It was public health interventions. Improve the coordination of relevant agencies and organizations. Do the work that, that, that John has, has started and will continue um, uh, as a part of, this, uh, of his legacy. Adopt the principle of health in all policies and, and, and the expectation, uh, I, didn't, I didn't know his comments, but uh, of more widely used health impact assessments. Facilitate the development of accountable health organizations. Start using language about one health system, about accountable health organizations to get people to think differently about what it is we're trying to do and the value that you bring to the table. Invite yourself to the table. If you wait for somebody to call you up, um, I thank you very much. It's been an honor not only to be here, um, I, I uh, um, um, am, am humbled by the work that you do. I'm humbled by the leadership role that Massachusetts has played um, you know, throughout the history of this country um, in terms of civic engagement, in terms of taking a stand, um, and in terms of making a difference as it relates to health for all people within a geographic area. Um, and, and let's hope that when we're on the other side of November, um, we are moving in a national direction to uh, make sure that the notion of health for all is where our nation continues moving. So thank you again. Thank you, John. If you talk long enough, no time for Q&A. So Jeff has told me no time for Q&A. You can't skewer me or put me on the spot. Thank you again for everything that you all do, and I hope the rest of your conference is um, um, a great conference. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Sanchez. I would just say amen. He has given us the charge. He's given us the perspective. He has set the table. Uh, for the work that we're going to do for the rest of the day together in these conferences. And he spoke right on time. We're going to claim some of the time that we ran over this morning at the expense of Q&A and so that you have time for discussion in your plenaries as planned because uh, there's been a lot of careful preparation uh, by your plenary presenters. So thank you very much, Dr. Sanders. Well, which one are you going to? Well,